The Swalski horse, we, we generally call it the Mongolian wild horse, uh, actually went extinct in the late 60s and thanks to animals that were in zoos both in the US as well as in Europe, we were able to breed the animals back up again and start a reintroduction program. So as of two years ago, from being listed as uh, extinct in the wild uh, under the red listing of IUCN, now they've been upgraded, and it's a relative term, upgraded to critically endangered, which means we have roughly around 500 to 600 animals in the wild, and that's when most of the species are listed as critically endangered. So what we do here, as, as in most breeding programs, most of the species go through sort of the stock market response, like the boom and the bust. When all animals do well in breeding, you run into a situation that you quickly run out of space because zoos do have limited amount of space. And the knee-jerk reaction to that is you stop breeding. Unfortunately, like in human, um, animals also stop reproducing after a certain age. So if you long, wait long enough that the animals are shutting down reproduction, you have another problem in hand that you have to start working with them to try to get them represented in the population. Similar situation unfortunately happened to this species too, even though these animals did very well in captive. For a number of years, these animals were not managed effectively. One of the strengths of this particular institute is we, we pick a species, we try to learn the most of that species in terms of the fundamental biology and try to actually use that to manage the population, be it a natural breeding or developing artificial reproduction tools. Uh, typically, we focus on artificial insemination and semen crab preservation as a long-term banking um, technology that we use. And the goal is, I mean, if, if, if somebody were to ask me, what, how, now how do you want to run these programs? I would say no more than five to 10 years. You should bring a species in, study everything you can, get one or two tools in place, demonstrate that tool consistently works, show that it's proof of principle that you're, you're done, you know everything that you want to manage. And then we should really be in a situation to move those animals out of the collection so we can go over to the next species and do the same because there are very few institutions that study these animals the way we do in, in zoos. Through, I would say pretty much globally, we definitely top in that list in terms of what we do with some of these species. And a lot of this is also facilitated not just by our scientists alone. Uh, we rely a lot on our animal management staff because they know these animals, they work extensively with these animals and also the facilities that exist, infrastructure in terms of managing these animals. Uh, so some of the things that you will never see happen in zoos. You, for research, you need large numbers of animals. You want those animals not being disturbed by people on a regular basis. We are not managing these animals for exhibit purpose. It is really need to study them carefully with really minimal intervention from people. And that's the beauty of this place and some of the work that we do. The blackfooted ferret was once uh, thought to be extinct. It was actually considered extinct, not listed yet, but it was in the um, 1981 that uh, a population was found out in Wyoming and it was the last wild population of ferrets. It was about a hundred animals and uh, the biologists you know, watched that, that population, but it did get hit with the two, two diseases. It, it got hit by sabbatic plague, a lot of animals died, and then canine distemper and a lot of animals died. It got down to to 18 animals and that was the last remaining wild black of ferrets in the world and it was decided um, after a lot of meetings to remove those last 18 and bring them into a breeding program in, in Wyoming and that was uh, in 1985 and 1986. It took another year in 87 to bring in that last 18th animal but we got all the 18 in and they became the breeding population that we know today and from those 18 uh, more than 6,600 kits have been born uh, from this program that's monitored by Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Fish and Wildlife. We have 30 blackfooted ferrets at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute in Front Royal, Virginia, and they are part of the species survival plan at our at our um, institution, and that is animals that are destined uh, for breeding, and then the, the offspring, the kids that are born this year, will go for preconditioning and to learn what a tunnel system is and learn what a burrow system is in, in the ground, and then get reintroduced uh, this fall in the Great Plains of, of North America.